Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm really glad to see you all here today. We have an incredibly important subject with some excellent guests, and I can't wait to dive in. I'm Brian Alexander. I'm the creator of the forum. I'm its host, your moderator, Chief Cat Herder, and I'll be guiding you through the next hour of conversation. But before we dive in, let me just begin by explaining a bit about the forum, uh, how it works, where it comes from, who supports it, and what we hope to achieve. So to begin with, you should know the forum is a weekly discussion about the future of higher education. Every week we have a conversation featuring one or more brilliant guests, each of whom addresses some particular aspect of academia and where it's headed. And that conversation happens with me, but especially and primarily with all of you, with dozens if not hundreds of people here. And we've been doing this for almost five years now. We've covered a wide range of topic with an extraordinary range of guests. And over, the over all these years, the forum has become, I think, a terrific spot, a kind of pop-up seminar for exploring where colleges and universities are headed. What I'd like to do uh, is to welcome uh, this week's guest, because we have a really, really important book, uh, and I want to draw attention to it. And I want to begin by, by welcoming one of the editors. Uh, we have uh, William Moner, who's coming to us from Elon University, uh, and William is an assistant professor in communication design. Uh, greetings, William. Greetings, Brian. How are you? Well, I'm great. It's it's <clears throat> always great to be joined with guests who are also members of the Bearded Club. So that, that's yeah. that's very very important. Well, I mean, it's it's very rare that we get to interact with our president. So uh, thank you for letting us on. <laughs> Well, William, there's there's so many things to ask you about your own work, uh, especially, I mean, the field of communication is so exciting right now in 2020, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes not. But I, I had a different question to ask you to, to introduce you to people. Mm -hmm. Looking ahead to this academic year, what are you going to be working on? What, what are the big projects and what are the big topics that are going to be soaking up your time and attention? Well, I think, I think, a uh, big part of it is just survival, you know? Um, and I mean that, I mean that in terms of, um, you know, drawing from last week's discussion with uh, Rebecca, uh, a co-editor co on this, um, trying to just do the best that we can given the circumstances that we've been handed. Mm -hmm. um, so I think one of the things that, uh, for better or worse, that we're gonna need to work on collectively is what do we do when we find ourselves in situations that have these big conflicts between the institutional priorities um, for survival and then the ability to be uh, be teachers, you know, and to do the right thing for our students and for our classes? And those things, um, I think, I think honestly, I think COVID has put those into. Um, a very clear view as as one of the rifts that we're starting to face. Um, and, you know, down the road, I don't want to pick on anybody uh, particularly, but you know, UNC Chapel Hill was the first to make headlines for needing to reverse course. And so I think we're going to need to deal with the implications and the fallout of that. Um, personally, uh, I'm, I'm excited to actually get back into the classroom and teach. It felt like even when we switched away from uh, in-person classes in March and we sent all the students home, it didn't quite feel the same and there was kind of a grieving period. So mm -hmm. I hope that we're, you know, as professors in the next couple of months starting to get back to what we know we can do best. Well, are, you said into the classroom. Um, is uh, Elon uh, opening for face-to-face -face mm -hmm. instruction or did you mean that metaphorically? Uh, we are open for face-to-face -face instruction. Um, so many of our classes are meeting on um, in person. Uh, we have tents set up around campus. We have uh, limited um, limited spaces for uh, for proper physical distancing. And you know, to its credit, I think Elon did a really uh, thorough job of preparing for the students coming back to the classroom experience. So um, so. I feel confident um, and they, they were also kind enough to make sure that if you did need accommodations for whatever personal reasons as faculty, that you were able to put those in um, through a process that kept it um, sort of, uh, uh, you know, outside of what um, might jeopardize you in, in any way sure. and be able to request for online only instruction or some other accommodations that would keep you safer, especially if you had health or underlying conditions. Understood. 
Oh, that's among other things. Among other things, and that's. It's glad to, I'm glad to hear from you as you go through this process because you give us a great view into that one mode of academic operations in fall of this year. Um, on the other hand, I do want to say good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Has anybody asked you to shave for your mask? Um, I've I've had some um, I've had some side eye, <laughs> but uh, no, well, nobody's great. nobody's yet asked me to shave. I, it was longer during the summer, but I, I trimmed it back. Well, please, uh, above, all, above all, please be safe um, and uh, um, all best for your students as well. I appreciate you. Um, now, we're, we're bringing you here today to talk about liberal education um, because you have uh, contributed to and co-edited this brand new book, which we can see just behind your right shoulder, beautifully praised. Oh, I didn't notice. Oh, that's incredible how that happened. <laughs> and for the rest of you, if you look something a little bit more kind of tan tangible on the bottom left of your screen, you should see a big fat icon of the book with a click link to uh, uh, to learn more about it and to purchase it um, from the excellent line at uh, Johns Hopkins University Press. In full disclosure, uh, my publisher as well. Um, so I've got a whole bunch of questions to ask. And the book is terrific. It's, it's very, very rich. Um, one thing to ask you is, um, how did you manage to get the huge range of complexity and variety and diversity that is liberal education into one book? How, how did you how did you manage to synthesize and make all of that cohere? Well, I wish I could say that it was that that broad of a scope. Um, I don't. I don't. I, th I think we just scratched the surface in a lot of ways. Um, you know, first I have to get, give a lot of credit to uh, my co-editors, Philip uh, Philip Motley, uh, who's in attendance, and Rebecca Pope Ruark, who is um, helping to uh, helping to contribute to the chat that I'm seeing to share where I grew up. I, I've, it's really weird to see like the town that I grew up in a chat window uh, as this is going on. But uh, when uh, when we got together on this, we were trying to get a program off the ground called the Design Thinking Studio for Social Innovation. And we tried to we tried to do a lot of things that would kind of break and trouble the the challenges of doing rich, immersive, and deep um, project based learning with teams and groups across disciplines. And we also didn't want them to focus on grades, and we also wanted to add a service learning component. And we sort of took this you know, throw everything into the mix that we want to achieve, you know, the things that come from the AAC and you and the high impact practices that are um, avowed there and centering on, um, we talked a lot in the early concept of our program, which is uh, one of the chapters, one of the case studies um, about things like student flourishing and, you know, a lot of the uh, professional writing and rhetoric stuff that's part of this book comes from Rebecca Pope Roark and her um, her academic discipline. So it was really a lot of trying to fit everything into this one big giant course. And the reason why I mentioned that is because we started to think, well, where are the other examples of this? Where are the other places where this innovation is happening? Um, many times, and, and I think you know this, Brian, and, and others in the audience, many times when we talk about innovation, it almost seems like a sleight of hand to talk about technology mm -hmm. and artificial intelligence and machine learning and um, platforms and all of those sorts of things. And when it comes down to it, design is a human process. And so what we're trying to do with the book and by highlighting all of the different schools is to show the breadth and depth of what that human process looks like. What are the meetings look like whenever I saw um, Chris from Northeastern? Uh, what were the meetings like whenever they were talking about redesigning their liberal arts core? You know, that's part of the case study. We wanted to hear about that stuff. What is um, a school like Susquehanna University that doesn't show up on anybody's radar and uh, not to not to be disparaging, but they're a very tiny school in the middle of central Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. high person from central Pennsylvania watching. Um, the, you know, those are the, those are the places where innovation still is happening, but the structure of the institutions has a lot to do with it. Um, we also wanted to talk about some um, places like Florida international university mm -hmm. and um, George Mason, 
Mm -hmm. other places that you don't think of as traditional liberal arts and liberal um, education hotbeds and to see how they're trying to bring those things into the mix too. Well, I guess that's, and, and friends, I'd like to ask one more question and then I really want to get the heck out of, out of your way. <laughs> you all ask your questions. And again, if you're new to the forum, remember the um, bottom of, the, of your screen, you have that white strip with a few buttons looking left end for you, that question mark or that raised hand. Um, and the, the, the reason the reason I asked why I, I began with a sense of, of, of plurality and diversity um, is is because you know we sometimes we think of liberal education as a small group of liberal arts colleges that do a certain thing, but in reality it's a it's a, it's incredibly complex. And it sounds like what you're telling me is that design thinking was a way of letting you get into that complexity and variety um, and opening up to thinking about liberal education as being well you. You guys cover a lot of institutional ground. I mean, we've got um, uh, Northeastern University. You've got liberal arts colleges like Conn College and Smith. You've got University of Wisconsin Green Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it, it seems like you're saying that liberal education can go just about anywhere. It should. <laughs> you know, um, we're part of a very long history. It's it's not um, it's not 150 years, 200 years of institutionalized. Um, higher education in the United States. It's thousands of years, right? Mm. And, you know, our our coverage of what we talk about with students should not be limited to the, the news of the day or the conflicts of the day. Uh, and I, I just think that what we wanted to do with the book was to bring um, bring a sensibility to this that, yes, we have these, um, we have these institutional needs to you know, bring STEM education into the conversation. We have these, um, you know, the, this push to do everything with technology and really trying to bring those factors into play. But that does not take away any of the um, any of the skills and the analytical, critical thinking skills uh, that come from the liberal arts, art history. Art history is has never been more relevant than it has been today. And I think there's uh, there's room for those discussions if we let those discussions happen. And so we need to he hear the voices of our humanities and social sciences yeah. uh, folks in, in the mix uh, just as strongly and as loudly as the others um, who are trying to uh, bring about engineering programs and things like that. Well, that's terrific. Um, it makes me think of design as a liberal art. We had a, a quick exchange in the chat box. I just wanted to read back for everybody because it just it really moved me. This is between Sarah San Gregorio, David Poole, and Rebecca Polkdorik, uh, beginning by saying, absolutely, design is a human process. That's from Sarah. David responds, innovation happens within the relationship between teacher and student. And Rebecca concludes, yes, when you allow the students to be partners and agent in the education process which is just beautiful. Um, we have a couple of questions that have just come in. Uh, I want to bring them up on stage so that we can all see them. Uh, this is from Phil Katz at the CIC, who says, I asked this from ignorance, not read the book. How do you define liberal in the book as distinguished from education? Sure. <clears throat> well, I, um, I can turn to the, uh, the passage in here and, and talk about <laughs> it specifically. Um, what we did, honestly, we followed the, uh, the AAC and U definition of liberal education, just so okay. most people... Okay. Okay. That's, that's the American Association of Colleges and Universities, a major association devoted to liberal education. Yes, yeah, thank you for clarifying that. Um, so we followed that definition, um, which... You know, and allow me to read it so that we can have it as, as part of the conversation. It uh, defines liberal education uh, as an approach to learning that empowers individuals and prepares them to deal with complexity, diversity, and change. It provides students with broad knowledge of the wider world, uh, science, culture, and society, as well as in-depth study in a specific area of interest. A liberal education helps students develop a sense of social responsibility as well as strong and transferable intellectual and practical skills, such as communication, analytical, and problem-solving skills, and a demonstrated ability to apply knowledge and skills in real-world settings. Yeah. Um, yeah. And many of the things that we tried to bring into the book 
um, have implications for those high impact practices that I mentioned, which is another tenet of what um, the, a the AACNU uh, really fosters. Uh, David Scobie's in the in the crowd here, and um, you know, bringing theory to practice is it's a really huge concern. You know, you have the, all of these all of these theories, um, and you have all of the tradition of the liberal arts, and we what what makes this um, radical, and this is the very first thing that we say about our definition of radical too, as we're talking about definitions, we're talking about more of a, a return. You know, it's returning to the root of something. We're not trying to break things and, and, and banish things. We're trying to get people to focus back on what our core mission is as, um, as people who practice uh, in the liberal arts and value a liberal education. So um, I, I think perhaps that may have answered the question, but, uh, if there needs to be clarification, please let me know. Well, that's a really good question. Um, uh, thank you, Phil. Uh, Phil has, is a historian and works in the Council of Independent Colleges and has a, a way with incredibly incisive and uh, practical questions. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Uh, David Scobie, already name-checked, uh, says that he likes the way that you have the double meaning of radical, rooted and transformative. Um, a quick question from Chris Gallagher. Um, how did this project influence your conceptions of the liberal arts and its role in the future of higher ed? Very personal question there. <laughs> well, you know, I've, um, like from, from my individual perspective, you know, I, I have been a techie for a good portion of my life. I, I'm enamored with te technology. I love it. And, um, it just seemed more and more that as we work with technology, the biggest problems that we have, the, the so-called wicked problems uh, that become the entry points to uh, questions that we address with the design thinking process, um, which is something that has been adapted by a lot of technology companies as a way to be more productive. Um, we viewed it as this could be really valuable for getting people from different disciplines in the room and really talking about those crucial wicked problems because technologists aren't the ones to solve them. If technologists could solve social problems, then we wouldn't have so many problems with Facebook. But, <laughs> but here we are, you know, our social, political, economic systems, all of those are bearing the brunt of what happens whenever we allow for technology to run unfettered and without also those critical checks along the way to say, hey, maybe we shouldn't do this. You know, I think of the um, Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park every time I say that, you know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Um, so I, I think that's where I'd like to end. That's a good answer. And uh, as long as we both of us avoid talking like Jeff Goldblum, we'll be okay. <laughs> Um, he's also know, from Pittsburgh. He's he's. Oh, that's that's true. That's true. That's true. We have, uh, uh, a bunch of questions have come in, including a raised hand from one Rebecca Pope Rourke. I right, bring her on stage. Your co-editor and uh, a future trans forum veteran. Hello, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to follow up on what William said with Brian's question there, because for mm -hmm. me initially, and I think this became clear very much later in the book that this was a process that. Um, Philip William and I, we weren't experts in this, right? We were not, we are not liberal arts experts running around the world and that's what we do. Um, we were people who teach in liberal arts institutions at the same institution at the time who were curious because we were dissatisfied with some, with some things and the things that we valued at our university were still kind of disparate. So we wanted to see what would happen if we put them together. If we, if we did try to break some of those things yeah. that we just take for granted, the things like semester hours and seat time and semesters in general, grades, especially what happens when you start removing that? I mean, you can't remove them clearly because you break a lot of systems that don't want to be broken. You have to assign students grades eventually. Um, but we were curious about, we tried to break a lot of things at once. So we were curious about what other institutions and different kinds of institutions were playing with, right? Um, we're, we're seeing a lot more of this need for um, 21st century literacies. Um, you know, so we were, we were looking at how other institutions like ours 
are, are thinking about that and are practicing that and how they're innovating related to that. Um, so for me, and I'm sure for William and Philip too, but I'll let them speak to it. It was really just an interesting exploration, right? I mean, I've taught business communication, for example, but the idea of a liberal arts core being in a business school, for example, right? Wow. I think that was George Mason. That was, mm -hmm. that was a weird thing for me to think about. Yeah. Um, but, you know, could really get excited about it once I asked them some questions and had read the case study and things like that. So um, it was fun to come at it not as an expert, as someone who's just really curious and wants to wants to kind of open a door and shed some light on what other folks are doing in this way. So it was a lot of fun in that sense. Yeah. Um, and to, to add on to that. I mean, uh, the, when the call went out, we were getting responses from all sorts of different institutions. And it was, it was really kind of fascinating to see how many different places the liberal arts were showing up and how people were thinking about that. Um, and those early brainstorming sessions about what this book was supposed to be and um, what it uh, eventually became. I mean, the book is a, what, a two year journey um, from, from start to finish. And so early on, um, our, our, I think our goals were to just, you know, um, get as many perspectives into the mix as possible, right? Well, speaking speaking of that, um, and and it's quite it's quite a mix. Um, Rebecca, I love how this is such a um, again back to radical. Uh, you know, you're rethinking a lot of this. We have a bunch of questions that actually turn on this question of interdisciplinarity. Uh, so let me bring these up, um, so you can both take a whack at it. Uh, this is one from uh, uh, Sarah San Gregorio, who asks, uh, uh, Tim Wise says, the idea of STEM is you can't have it without mesh, media literacy, ethics, sociology, and history. Are the universities who have initiatives in this area that you're aware of? I should know more of that now that I'm in a technical institution. <laughs> Off the top of my head, I'm not sure I have any. Um, I can, I, I do know of one. Um, uh, there's a, a professor at Marquette University who has an archive of um, every everything that Mark Zuckerberg has ever said um, publicly about. Uh, he has the Facebook uh, the Facebook files, is, as he calls it. Um, and uh, as if you'll, as we progress, I'll look up his name. I just want to get his last name right so I can uh, properly name check him. Sure. But um, but he is. They're also. <laughs> The curriculum there, where um, where he has been brought on as the ethicist who is going along with the um, the expansion of STEM uh, at that institution. So, I, I think any place that is bringing in the question of ethics is grappling with um, with that problem. Thank you for the question. Oh, it's a great question. Is that the uh, I, think, files? I think too, if you think about a lot of institutions that are not necessarily slacks, but are um, it, liberal arts grounded. I think you see that more, right? Um, Elon, for example, now has a full-time engineering program, but that's very much you know, grounded in liberal education as well as what ABET's looking for in their particular um, accreditation models. Um, I think of places um, like Olin University or college, the engineering school, that's very much grounded in problem-based learning and ethics and things like that as well. So, and that's kind of that's kind of like one of the new startup kind of colleges, right? I mean, what does that look like? How does that, you know, outside of what traditional accreditation looks like, how do you build programs like that? Um, so I think those kinds of places, I know there's some great work being done at Michigan State in this area. Um, their wide program is amazing. So I, I think it's, we're probably not calling it mesh, but I think it's happening in a lot of different places. Um, even where they're calling it STEAM, which is a very K-12 kind of thing to say, but that's um, what I thought it was just yeah, I think we just have to kind of look for them because they're definitely there. Um, they must just might not be publicizing it as much as they should. Yeah, we need, we need more of that. And I'll, I'll mm -hmm. try to point the forum at uh, more and more examples of that. Um, the uh, um, Michael Zimmer. Um, yes. That's the one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have, and thank you both. Uh, th that was a great question. And we have a couple of follow-ups on that. Uh, this is one from uh, Sunni Dean uh, Raj, uh, who asks, uh, regarding liberal education and professional education, is there a real divide? What are some of the best strategies to overcome those silos? 
and, and Raj started to say something about Elon, but got cut off by the box. But th that question is enough to go on for right now. What, how, how do we uh, uh, cross that border? How do we cross those streams? Do you want to take that? Or you want to take <laughs> is this the time to call Philip up to the stage? I mean, is that? <laughs> I can, if you're both are going to bail, you know, I'll have to just drag Philip on the stage and just cover the stage with, with editors. Here we go. Well, I think all, all three of us would say they shouldn't be, right? They, they, sh they shouldn't be distinct, um, that you can't have professional education without citizenship education and, and ethics and, you know, understanding history of what's happened in industry or, or, or community building or politics, because that's absolutely going to affect how people are, are um, participants in a professional culture at some point. You know, can, if we cannot think about it as training and thinking, think about it more as pre preparation mm -hmm. um, and engagement, I think that they, they aren't separate and they shouldn't be, but that's probably a grad school training issue that needs to be addressed. Good thinking, a good design, good design angle for this as well. Mm -hmm. Let me just welcome uh, Phil Motley, who is looking like, what just happened here? You know, and start somebody <laughs> up, and they don't tell them about it ahead of time. You know, uh, <laughs> welcome, welcome, Phil. Are, are you on the Elon's campus today yourself? I'm right now under the bus where I was just thrown by my colleague. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely spot under the bus. <laughs> I haven't seen you in months, so I'm sure you're under a bus. <laughs> yes, I am on Elon's lovely campus right now. Good. It is a lovely campus. In fact, he's here. right through that wall. He's on the other side of the wall. <laughs> from me. Yeah. 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 Being buried, apparently. Do you, Phil, do you want to take a whack at that question about, about crossing the streams between liberal arts and yeah. professional, pre-professional? I'll try. I'll, I'll go back in time to when I was in high school and thinking about going to college. And at the time, I was very interested in art and ultimately became a fine art major at Davidson College. But I remember looking at art schools at the time and my parents in their wisdom ultimately pushed me towards, you know, a more traditional college environment, a liberal arts institution like Davidson College, where I could study art or other things rather than um, a very siloed or very specialized type place like an art and design focused institution. And I think in the end, at least for me, that was a, a wise, um, you know, that was wise advice. And I think that relative to the question at a place like Elon, which I'll use as an example since I know it better than most, you know, I think professional school education here at Elon can't, even if they wanted to, can't escape being part and parcel of the liberal arts core of this institution. It's built into that. So if you're an engineering student or a strategic communication student or a student in the school of business, you're still deeply rooted in that liberal arts tradition, the liberal arts core of that curriculum. And so I think that ultimately that makes for a more well-rounded future professional, regardless of, of where the student ends up going. Yeah. And I think part of it too is, is professional schools whose hands are tied by their accrediting agencies or right. how many credits they can, students can take. Yeah. Um, right. If you think of the engineering ABET, I mean, there's very little slim margins for things that they can take outside of an engi engineering core. So there's some work to be done there to be able to really offer that model more broadly for students who are in those kinds of professional programs, the AACSB in business, those kinds of work. Well, thank you. Uh, I, it, the, the creating agencies is very, uh, that's a very, very important topic. And again, next month, we're really lucky to have the head of one of the creating agencies as a guest. So we can put this question to uh, to him, um, Philip. Thank you. I'm going to keep you all three of you on the stage as long as I can, uh, either before the wheels of the bus go around and around and pull you out, or if uh, <coughs> if we need to, if someone else wants to join us, um, then I'll, I'll I'll boot one of you. Um, but uh, uh, David Hull, I, I hope that this has been answering your question. Uh, we have a few others that cut this from a, a different angle, um, and one from uh, our awesome friend uh, Tom Haynes coming mm. to us from Houston. Um, asks the question, a uh, different organizational question. How do you characterize the relationship between design for the purposes of teaching and learning versus organizational reinvention? Mm -hmm. So design for teaching and learning versus design for rebooting an organization. Uh, I'll take a first swing at it, but for Rebecca, William and I and our colleague, Joel Hollingsworth in computer science in our 
uh, work that we did uh, that's featured in the book in our chapter on uh, the studio for social innovation. I think we looked at design as a, a process and a tool set in which to bring together disparate students from a variety of majors across the institution in a way that would allow them to leverage their strengths and their knowledge and expertise via the tool set. The tool set was a linking or a bridge to those students who are used to being in a classroom with other business majors or other anthropology majors or sociology majors, et cetera. The design thinking process in the end, I think we realized is nothing magical, but it's a great um, convener and distributor of that knowledge in a way to bring people together via the process, via the tools, via design to then go attack a certain problem. And for us, it was issues in the community that were socially rooted, but it could be organizational or technological or, or what have you. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I do want to add just a, a, a bit to that too. You know, the, the question about teaching and learning versus organizational reinvention. Uh, one of the things that I want to introduce to this is that by doing things that are new and innovative, the teachers have to become learners. We learned a lot uh, by trying to do something different with, uh, with our students and trying to get them different types of skills that would be beneficial to them when they moved on. We wanted them to be, um, we wanted them to be more agile um, as students whenever they went into the workplace and know how to work with each other as teams. And that's hard to do in the classroom. You know, we can't just make it group work and say that we check the box for collaboration because we know what group work looks like and it's a mess. Mm -hmm. But if, if, if what we can do is focus on everybody in the situation becoming learners, then that becomes much more important. You know, I, and sometimes I think we lose track of that as faculty that we kind of dig our heels in and say, this is our discipline and this is what we do here. Mm -hmm. And I'm, not going to work with these other folks who are trying to change the way we do business at this institution, that's dangerous because that leads to siloing and rifts and that sort of stuff right at the moment where we need better collaboration and communication across those disciplines. So, um, so the tension between the teaching and learning aspects of this versus the organizational reinvention, I do, I mean, you know, we've, we've had the benefit, I think, of being at an institution that has, um, it's small enough where we all get to know each other, uh, but large enough that we can still kind of carve out our own corner and carve out our own identity in mm -hmm. certain ways. And so um, when we think about reinvention, I think that's part of why we, we had the book. You know, how do you do this at, a, at FIU? They have tens of thousands of students mm -hmm. and they're serving, it's a Hispanic serving institution. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they talk about this in their case study, uh, you know, all of the trials and tribulations to make the learning more relevant to the people they're serving and how that builds back into what your institutional reputation is um, on the national stage. So I think it works together, but I, I don't know, you have to, the, the teaching and learning goes first to me. Um, and I would just say very, very briefly that design thinking itself as a process is just the latest packaging of a very humanistic inquiry process right it's you know it, it's the latest kind of buzzy word thing um it's probably even going out of fashion at this point um but but all it is is just it's a humanistic process for developing innovation technology meeting social needs right so it's easier to kind of just port that wherever you need it and call it you what it needed but it's that iteration piece of it right it's human and it's iterative um, so I think that was that's something important to remember when we think about design, whether it is in teaching or learning or it is in kind of institutional reinvent, reinvention. Yeah. I, I can see why um, you guys are the perfect editors for this book. Um, it's just terrific to follow your ideas bouncing um, back and forth across all of you. Um, we have um, a few more questions that have come up, and, and these hit from different angles now. So I want to make sure that we bring in all of these. And this is someone whose name I'm going to try to pronounce, and I will probably mangle it. Please, please forgive me and, and instruct me how to say it correctly. This is Professor Catherine uh, Fowle at Bucknell, who asks, how do you deal with questions of sustainability of such initiatives yeah. in this era of COVID-challenged budgets? <laughs> <laughs> if we knew. <laughs> Your first response, you know. <laughs> 
Yeah. Day drinking is not a good answer. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I would say in our case, that issue of sustainability rose its um, scary head long before COVID arrived um, in the sense that what we were trying to do, as Rebecca said earlier, was we tried to break so many entrenched structures, maybe one too many, um, that part of our challenge was how do we appeal to students, uh, communicate to students, recruit students for something that was outside their normal um, vantage point on what their higher education experience would be like. At one point we said our, our program, which was an immersive semester where they took all of their courses with us packaged in one kind of big course. We tried to sell it as study abroad, but you just don't leave campus. And then a couple of students told us to stop doing that. That was stupid. So we stopped. <laughs> But we were trying to get across the idea that this was similar commitment and a similar sort of immersion, but you didn't get on an airplane and go somewhere else. Um, but sustainability was it was tricky for us and maybe for other people because what we were trying to do was a little bit outside the norm. It was a lot outside the norm, really, what we were trying to do. And it was also, there was a lot of faculty time involved, right? I mean, we were getting releases from our departments to do this. And, you know, where's the line between you know, what's feasible economically and are we meeting our contracts depending on how many students are in that um, in that group. So sustainability, I think, especially for the stuff that um, like ours, we probably try to do too much at once. We build a capstone kind of without a, a funnel up to it. But I think that especially the institutions in the book who have done small things over time and continue to build up, right? It's those those small tweaks until you get to maybe a full program revision or you know a, a curriculum revision i think those are the things that are going to help you be sustainable yeah because um, you can you can iterate on those and if one piece of it doesn't go well okay fine let's figure out what happened and what are we going to do next are we going to you know reboot it and try again or are we going to move in another direction um so the data is always coming in when you're doing um, small iterations as opposed to such a big one like we tried to do when the data was kind of dumping us on the head and it was hard to kind of pick what was connected to what um, through the program. Yeah. We had a, a jump on question about that from, um, mm. uh, from Raj, uh, who asks, when resources are scarce, which alternative metrics may we use beyond enrollments? I mean, I know your book came out before all of this, so I, I mean, it's kind mm. of unfair for me to ask, but I, I'm just wondering if uh, you could deploy that wonderful design thinking mentality and, uh, um, and, and say, well, we've um, <clears throat> we've been working on long-term assessment of what happens. So, looking at looking at what students are using a couple of years away from a program, you know, it's 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 really hard in the moment to look at at an at an experiment like this or like what we did in our chapter and say that you know that the the perfect assessment is what people are telling us right after it happened because they're not seeing from that you know, that myopic view, what the benefits really were to that experience. If you talk to them two, three years down the road, you're going to see a much different experience. Oh my goodness. I use project management skills all the time in my job. Um, I, I'm forced to collaborate with folks. I need to write for the public. And those were all things that we wanted to emphasize with our particular experiment. But as we pulled the case studies, all of those fundamental things, the writing and communicating, the critical thinking, the collaboration, those types of things that people were baking into their, um, either their liberal arts core, like Connecticut College or Northeastern, uh, Chris Gallagher's in the in the crowd here, um, you know, or, um, you know, some of the things that are happening even at the community college level um, that uh, Leah Lambert discusses in the afterword. Uh -huh. You know, those, all of those things are, um, are places where, you know, these innovations are taking taking shape. And back to the question of resources and alternative metrics, I mean, sometimes it's just paying attention to the things that are happening and talking, like counting them up, you know, asking your faculty, asking your staff, what are you doing that we can start to build on? You know, and maybe it's a little bit more quali qualitative than quantitative mm -hmm. at first. At first, but then it can shift over. Yeah. Raj, that's a, that's a wonderful slash of a question. Thank you. And I appreciate all of you on, on struggling with that. Uh, I'm conscious of time, uh, friends, and we have a whole stack of, uh, of, of questions that have come in. And I also, this is the point in the program where we try and nudge things a bit towards the future. 
Um, and we have a nice provocation from uh, another dean. Uh, we have all kinds of deans all over the place today, which is great. The dean for the session. This is Matthew Duvall at Washington University in St. Louis, who has, I've heard that I disagree that the word liberal is so loaded in the public that we should stop using it. Thoughts on whether we are putting ourselves in a bunker defending the term? Well, I guess a bunker is worse than a bunker, so I'm not sure. <laughs> hmm. You know, uh, I, we... <sighs> we went round and round on this. We okay. really did. Um, I mean, we even talked about, um, we, we were calling some of the things we're, we were writing as manifestos, and that yeah. went away because we were afraid of what that might look like in the, in the public eye too. Yeah. You know, but look, liberal at, at its core, it's about being a free thinking and free flowing and free moving individual in a society who has the core capability of being a citizen, right? Mm -hmm. That's what liberal means. And it's not capital L liberal. It's not being shouted at by conservatives liberal. It's certainly not gonna make the marketing materials. And so that's maybe where mm -hmm. the pushback is really gonna come from. We can't just go and lead with, we are liberal because then we don't get the types of perspectives that make for a well-rounded student body where people learn how to interact with others. So that's, I, I have to stop there because I could go on forever about this, but uh, <laughs> others are welcome to join, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's one of the reasons that we, we didn't use it interchangeably, but um, we tried to distinguish between liberal education and liberal arts yes. in a way. And we, you know, we also tried um, to use the terminology of 21st century skills um, because the 21st century skills that people are saying they want to engender in their students are liberal arts products, yeah. right? The, the critical thinking and the community awareness and, and all of those things, um, literacy, you know, um, all of those things are liberal arts or what we do and what we build in the liberal arts. Um, and, you know, some people who might not respond to liberal are certainly going to respond to skills. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's maybe one potential bridge, um, but that's a decision that we, we're going to have to make whether, you know, can we change the name of something that's been this for millennia? 2,000 years, yeah. Well, that's, thank you for asking the question. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you all for wrestling with it. I, 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 I would vote for manifestos, but I, I respect you. <laughs> um, well, when we brought, when we brought the, the book to Greg, Britton at, at Hopkins, you know, he said, you know, it's nice to see a book that isn't about like, that isn't a manifesto for saving the liberal arts anymore because we've done that so many times. Sure. We're preaching to the choir, right? That, that this one was different in that sense that here's some, here's some stuff that people are doing, you know, and there, you know, each chapter, each case study offers, here's some things that you might try or here's some advice that we have um, based on this. So, so it ends up being a little more practical and on the ground maybe than yeah. Um, just to, to add on to that, yeah, the chapters have a very specific structure. <clears throat> Every writer was asked to provide their radical vision for a liberal education at the top of their chapter. Mm -hmm. And then they could use that chapter to talk about what they're doing at that in their institution, the, um, the things that went well, the things that went poorly, the things that failed, and then the key takeaways. Every chapter ends with a list of four or five key mm -hmm. takeaways um, that other institutions like those can try out. So that structure for the case studies, I think, really opened up uh, what, we, what we wanted to be is a conversation, right? A, a way for other institutions to see themselves in the chapters that were written. But also there are vision chapters at the end of the book. And so hopefully this segues back into the future side of things for you, Brian. But um, the vision chapters are how we use liberal education to confront things that are happening in the 21st century. Uh, so Randy Bass has written about uh, the dispositions that we need in, um, in the age of machines. And he draws a lot on Joseph Ayun's work uh, mm -hmm. for, for that. And that's also part of uh, Northeastern's case study. Mm -hmm. But we also have um, you know, Peter Fountain and Nancy Chick who are writing about slowing down and, be, you know, and the depth mm -hmm. of encounters with materials. Mm -hmm. that that's more important uh, in a lot of ways than trying to move fast and break things, you know? And so uh, so it gives us a lot to consider. We have um, folks who have written about being playful and creative, um, the uh, reacting to the past uh, mm -hmm. is uh, that that group is uh, being talked about by uh, Bill, um, 
uh, uh, Bill Sullivan, uh, who, who wrote a chapter, and uh, back to the AAC and U, uh, Ashley Finley contributed a chapter on um, reframing or remapping soft skills as essential skills, mm -hmm. you know, and all of those things that get feminized as soft skills mm -hmm. in education, or I'm sorry, in engineering and technology really are the essential skills of the jobs that you need to do uh, if you're building user experiences and things like that. So I, I, this is great. And by the way, I just want to say that in, in, in the chat stream, we have conversations now going on entirely in German. Um, <laughs> make sure that we have like the full liberal arts represented here alongside questions about marketing alongside questions about engineering and humanities. So we, in the Future Trends Forum, we have a snapshot and a nice example of, uh, of a liberal education. Well, um, well, I can start speaking Pittsburghese if you prefer to, to get some additional cultural. <laughs> that's, that's, that's great. Um, but uh, I'm, I, I'm conscious of time. I would like to see that. But I want to bring up a question from my dear friend and hero, Joellen Parker, who knows from liberal education. She asks, Sustainability raised the question of demand and outcomes. Mm -hmm. Who outside of the academy thinks these outcomes are important enough to invest in? I'll put that question up again on the screen. Just so yeah. this is a deep one. I honestly, um, we do talk about that in the in the book uh, introduction uh, about why um, why we found this to be such a compelling topic. And, you know, it, it goes back to the folks like Steve Jobs, who, you know, had a liberal arts education um, at his core and uh, other folks who have been influential in technology that came at it from a different perspective. And so I, I'll, I'll also reference back to talking about Mark Zuckerberg. He went to Harvard for a couple of years, got his Harvard cred, but only walked out with tech skills. And so I, I think... I think if we look closely enough, and I know that this is probably a question on on top of a question, if we look closely enough that the demand and outcomes would become evident. But um, I think there's also a part, Rebecca, you might have something to say about this, where you know, four or five years out, there are surveys of what employers are looking for in, um, in their employees. And time and time again, those surveys come back with, they need to be able to write better. They need to be able to communicate across um, interdisciplinary teams or outside of their own discipline. Mm -hmm. So those, it's, again, it's not what's happening in the institution. It's not what we're telling parents, you know, to get them in the door of a higher education institution. It's what we're seeing on the other side of it five years out that I think could be more compelling to look at. Mm -hmm. Kind of employers have been saying that for decades and decades and decades, and it, it just hasn't seemed to sunk in somehow. Randy Bash just made a comment in there that everyone values those skills unless they're tethered to a major or a career, and then they get isolated. Um, so there's some wisdom there. Well, you you want someone who has that that leading indicator of you know uh, pre med or yeah. dentistry or um, astronomy. Um, and that's that's the leading uh, the leading uh, aspect of it. Um, so, well, that, that's a that's a really good question. It brings to mind uh, NYU Prof Scott Galloway's claim that we should be expecting some huge investments from major major companies in elite higher education. Mm -hmm. I don't see any evidence of that yet? But um, I would imagine this is the kind of case that we need to make for that kind of support. Mm -hmm. uh, my, one of my cats likes to be a coworker. <laughs> Um, and this is not an outside investor, or if you creditor. It's an accreditor. Yeah, well, <laughs> he's checking it out. We want to make sure he's happy and purring. Uh, we, we have more questions coming in, and I want to make sure that we get as many of these in as possible. Um, this is one from uh, uh, actually, this follows up very nicely. This is from Martin Tillman, uh, who's the president of Global Career Compass, uh, and Martin asks. Do you foresee the future, the value of liberal edu arts education will be transformed? Will it lose value in a post-COVID world of work? I think there's a possibility for the opposite. Um, Please tell me. It's embedded more deeply when we see how we've dealt with this crisis or not dealt with this crisis. 
um, in ways that someone potentially with a lot more ethics training, right, or uh, you know, a broader spectrum of humanity might have been able to do something different um, and encourage something different. I'm, my hope is that there, there's going to be contraction. I mean, we know there's going to be contraction um, in a lot of different ways. But my hope would be as some of those programs do contract, that they get absorbed into other programs, right? I mean, just the I refer to George Mason again, you know, having that humanistic liberal arts core in their business program you know, is, is a very different model, but it's gonna prepare those business students in a way that someone with just a general business degree probably doesn't have. It's gonna have more of those sensibilities um, that employers are demanding, but but aren't coming. So my hope is that it would it would integrate. Yeah. Maybe that's uh, idealistic. We missed out on it uh, as far as soliciting from them for, for a chapter, but the University of Virginia just recently reorganized their first couple of years of their campus experience around, um, you know, for, to borrow Randy Bass's term, dispositions. Mm -hmm. um, they organized around some three key areas and no matter where you're going or what you're doing on that campus, there are different programs that you can move yourself into um, and get experience with uh, those bigger questions before you get started and more specialized. And, you know, I, I often wonder what it would be like if we just didn't have majors you know, if you could take a portfolio of minors, you know, so if I, if I came out of school with five minors, would that be more powerful than coming out with two majors and a minor? You know, what, why are we valuing, I took an additional class in this versus, you know, I have a wide variety of different things that I can draw from in my toolkit, you know, that's, so I, I think there's a lot of rethinking that might happen in light of COVID. If I have a nurse who um, is well-versed in language studies, that's going to be hugely valuable because we know that COVID is affecting um, uh, disproportionately um, BIPOC uh, folks in the United States. You know, we are uh, we're facing a crisis there, and so language skills are very important um, to to cut across to uh, Hispanic populations, Latinx populations, etc. Yeah, th that's where I think it explodes. You know, and and gets to be more of an opportunity. In, you've struck a, a whole series of uh, nerves in the audience. The, uh, Rebecca just said that she wants to change the words major and minor, which I appreciate. Martin Tillman asked for a portfolio of minors, which sounds like a good idea. Um, the only problem with all this is that we're at the last minute of our program. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I have to uh, figure out how to, um, among other things, wrap this up and not irritate my friend here who doesn't want to leave. Um, uh, First of all, first of all, let me ask, um, you know, we have the book. Um, there's a link to the book in the bottom left part of the screen so you guys can all find it. Um, let me ask each of you, um, how can we best keep up with each of you? Uh, Rebecca, last week you said that you're tweeting like mad. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and of course you have your Agile faculty site. And maybe something more come up down the road. Um, yeah, let's really keep up with you. How can we learn more about you once you get out from under the bus? <laughs> me? <laughs> Another fill here. I, I don't know. <laughs> oh God, that's a good question. What What do you want? An email address? <laughs> well, is that the best way for people to find out about you and keep up with your work? Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know. Um, easy. Well, or the bio that I think you had that I shared with you. Yeah. Um, oh, sure. Link to to Elon's website and information. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, and William, first on the program and uh, and the last off. What's What's the best way to find you? And uh, well, um, I, similarly, you can um, you can catch up with me on the Elon website, and I'm uh, I'm getting my professional uh, public face together in the next year or so, and so cool. um, so look for more from that. But uh, um, yeah, the, I think the Elon link in the bio is is just fine for right now. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you for your time, Brian. Oh, the, you guys did all the work. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you for this uh, fantastic book. Um, and uh, above all, thanks to uh, everybody else in the program uh, who has been just sharing so many thoughts, so many questions, mostly in English. Um, it's, it's been a delightful, delightful conversation. Thank you all. But don't go away. We need to tell you just a, a 30 seconds about what's happening over the next few weeks. Uh, first of all, uh, we have a whole bunch of topics coming up again. Everything from high flex to accessibility, the perfect mess of academia to academic women of color, a lot of work coming up in the next few months. So again, just head to tinyurl.com slash 
Forum Fall 2020 for more. Uh, we also have lots of ways of keeping this conversation going. Uh, Twitter seems to be the most popular, so just use the hashtag FTTE or tweet at me at Brian Alexander. Um, if you'd like to go into the past, again, we have almost five years of, of programs. We have 219 videos, actually. Just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive, and the YouTube playlist is there for you. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, thank you all again for a, a fascinating conversation, letting us rethink higher education from this great combination of liberal education and design thinking. Thanks to the editors and contributors to this book. Um, and thanks to all of you for all of your thoughts and questions. In the meantime, keep thinking about this stuff. Good luck as the fall semester begins. Above all, stay safe, and we'll see you all online. Bye-bye. Spider says goodbye, too.